Hey, engineering students. Well, it is Thanksgiving break and I'm here in room 101 and I'm gonna record a little video for you guys. Uh, you'll be watching this, of course, the week after Thanksgiving break. So happy week after Thanksgiving break and uh, welcome back to school. I wanna firstly say congratulations to the whole crew. I didn't think I realized just how, um, how long and challenging, long, that uh, equilibrium assignment was both for the basic level and the advanced level that was actually long um, some of you actually submitted as many as four pages of working and equations and diagrams and there was so many good things there there's an infinite number of places to mess up on these diagrams these equilibrium equations but i can see by and large you guys have been watching the videos um, working hard to understand asking me when you don't and then reproducing it many of you practically perfectly so well done to everyone, okay? Let's keep it up and don't be afraid to ask me if you have questions. I do wanna um, mention a couple of things that came out of me grading those assignments. And I did leave these as notes. Be sure that you're going in the way that I showed you uh, to see the comments, because that is very specific to each of you. But in general, there are a few things that I noticed quite a lot. So uh, the first one is, I did want to point out that if you have what I am calling a super simple symmetric static situation, a super simple symmetric static situation, SSSSS, then it is always acceptable to sort of, you know, neatly bypass the equilibrium equations. And for those who don't like doing extra working, you know who you are. Um, this is good news for you. You can bypass the whole thing. And you can just say, take the whole load and divide it equally amongst the vertical supports. I'm referring, of course, to question three, where there were, <clears throat> let's see, I think there were three students of 55 kilograms each. They were perfectly symmetrically placed. There were two support reactions, nothing sideways. Everything was just mirror image, okay? A super simple symmetric static situation. And when you have that, it is fine to say, you know what, total load is 165 kilograms uh, multiplied by 10, 1,650 newtons approximately. I'm just going to split that down the middle, okay, 825 newtons on each side. I don't need to do the moment equation to prove that. It's just logical, it's obvious. So that is perfectly acceptable in those simple cases. Most cases are not simple. Now, the uh, other thing I want to correct as well, um, we have a kind of a little bit of a bog down. It's, it's very normal, very natural, but when it comes to negative vectors, what does it mean to have a negative vector? So if you, if you draw a vector and then you label that or you, you, you know, define that as being, let's say, negative 10 newtons, All right? Let me, uh, here we go. This screwdriver is a vector, okay? It's pointing, pointing that way. That's the tail, that's the head. If you have this and it's pointing that way and then you call that a negative 10 Newton vector, then what you're really saying is the magnitude is 10, but the direction is the other way. That is what a negative label on a vector means. If I flip it around like that, I shouldn't show the negative anymore. This is now a 10 Newton vector. Okay, so I could call something a negative 10 Newton vector, or I could just call it a 10 Newton vector. Clearly, I think, I think it's clear, this is the easy way to do it. Call it a 10 Newton vector and switch it around, redraw it to point the correct way. So I'm really referring to like um, question one on the equilibrium assignment. If you assume that your two reactions were both pointing straight up, which is very normal, great place to start, if you had done the sums correctly, then you would have found that the uh, leftmost reaction was coming up with a negative answer. It was negative 10, negative 10 pounds. So that negative 10, it's, it's not referring to your original sign convention, okay? Under original sign convention, you have the, you know, up and to the right is positive and so on, but that's not what the negative means. The negative is sending the signal to you that your vector, instead of, well, instead of pointing this way, is actually that way. So you could show this in one of two ways. You could keep the diagram with 
that reaction pointing up, but off to the side, put negative 10 pounds. Okay, and by the way, I love it, those of you who are like summarizing and listing the forces, um, that is great. I shouldn't really have to dig through your equations to find them. Um, so you could show it upwards, call it negative 10 pounds, but it's better if you honestly redraw the diagram, redraw the vector down, erase it, redo it, and then put 10 pounds next to it. Whatever you do, do not reverse the vector and then also show 10 pounds, sorry, and then also show negative 10 pounds because remember the negative label flips it. So either keep it that way, call it negative 10. What we know that means is 10 that way, okay? The negative 10 does not refer to a downwards direction, it refers to a flipping of your original drawing, okay? What I'm saying there applies to the answers you get out of the equilibrium equations. Of course, when you put the vectors into the equilibrium equations to begin with, you do use positives and negatives to show left, right, up, down. Okay, so it's a little bit of a subtle difference and um, I guess I'm used to that and you are on the way to getting used to that, like with all things. Does anyone feel, by the way, that these are kind of like fun? It's kind of like completing a Sudoku puzzle or a crossword or something, uh, or like playing solitaire, and like you feel like you can see you're about to win, like getting all those logical pieces in place. Um, I think some of you are enjoying it. I know I'm enjoying it. Let me now move into this week's content. So we're going to uh, kind of expand our um, repertoire a little bit. Instead of just using the pin joints and the simple sports, we're gonna add in a third and that is the fixed condition. We've talked about the fixed condition, we haven't actually analyzed it yet. And then the other thing we're gonna do, we're gonna add in some uh, extra load types. We've really just done point loads, okay? Where the, the, the force is coming at you in like a needle sharp, um, ew, a little, little pointy location, and that's it. It's, it's the way you wanna deal with it, but life doesn't come at you in point loads as I have mentioned before. Life tends to come at you, in fact, in distributed loads. And that, uh, that is always then turned into a point load for the analysis. But I want you to get used to uh, seeing that point, sorry, seeing that distributed load and knowing what to do with it. So in this, in this uh, digital whiteboard lesson, we're gonna look at distributed loads. Remember, those are always measured in things like uh, pounds per feet, pounds per inch, Newtons per meter, things like that, okay? A force per a distance. And then you multiply by the distance that it's across, and that gives you the point load force, which then always acts in the very center of that distributed load. I think that's fairly intuitive, and you'll see how we play that out. Um, we're also gonna look at concentrated moment loads. Okay, a concentrated moment load. And this one can be a little hard to imagine. I think it's a little hard to imagine primarily because in, in my view, there really is no such thing as a concentrated moment. You can't just like apply a little magical moment at a place. Moments are always in fact created um, by little tiny force couples where one force is down, one is up. They're the same force in opposite directions and it creates a little moment. So. What, what does this look like though? It's like, imagine imagine you have a beam. Like imagine this beam is fixed, sticking out of a wall, um, just like this. And someone like grabs the beam in the middle and doesn't just like pull down on it or hang off it or push it up or pull it at an angle, but someone grabs it with two hands and actually like kind of twists it like that, okay? like that way or like that way. You can only go two directions, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, so we're no longer just simply pulling, we're grabbing with two hands and then we're twisting at one location. Obviously, this is, as I said, a force couple, two forces creating uh, a moment, but we're gonna refer to it as a concentrated moment acting right there. We won't show my hands or anything like that. We're just gonna show like the little twistiness that happens there. Now, of course, the thing isn't gonna move. It's a statics problem. It's fixed in one place, but I'm trying to show you, that is what I mean when I say a concentrated moment. Someone is grabbing the thing, metaphorically or, in, or really, 
and they're giving it a twist, okay, right at that place. Now, um, let me do one more, one more little uh, physical illustration here before we go to the digital whiteboard. I want to give you a very uh, common, very real example of why all this analysis is so important and when, how it gets used. And for this, I will resurrect the uh, <laughs> the purple, um, what is this? The, uh, it's kind of black panther colors, I guess. Um, this does not have all the pieces that it did have a month ago. Sorry about that. But we had some great flights back in uh, June, I think it was. So, you know, just dwell on that. So we can think of this aircraft wing, okay? Think of this as those like beams that you've been drawing, that you've been encountering in your assignments that I've been drawing. A wing is a great example of that beam. Now, think of the body, the body of the plane where I'm holding the fuselage. Think of that as being that, uh, that, that, that wall. You know how we draw like the little wall with the hatching and then the beam sprouts out of it? That's what the body of the plane is. We don't really care what's happening with the body of the plane. We don't care its shape, um, what the other wing is doing, or anything like that. We're just saying that the wing comes in and it is attached to a uh, body of some sort. And it is a fixed. So this is an example of a fixed end condition, of a fixed support, okay? Where a wing comes into the fuselage. That's called the wing root. This is the wing tip. This is the wing root. The wing root is a perfect example because it's held there, it's glued, it's welded, it's riveted. There's a whole lot of connections going on actually. Um, but relative to the body, if the wing experiences lift upwards, it can't simply slide up the fuselage, okay? It, there's a vertical reaction force. Now the whole plane might move, but we don't care about that. We're talking about the fuselage being the reference point, okay? Uh, if the wing gets pulled out to the side, how would that happen? I don't know, maybe in some like banking maneuvers. But if the wing gets pulled or pushed uh, left or right, it also is not going to travel into or out of the fuselage, hopefully. It is riveted, bolted, welded, however, in place. Now also, if we get moments created, which we always get moments created, because forces exist, if you get Again, some of that lift force pushing up. Okay, imagine that. You can sort of see this wing wants to bend upwards, but the, the connection at the fuselage resists that. And so we're gonna analyze that this video, um, show how we, how, we, how we show that, how we draw that in our diagram. How do we model the fixed condition right here? This is not a pin, not a hinge, not a symbol sport. This is fixed if ever, if ever there was fixed. The wing is also a really good example because it naturally uh, always has uh, two of the uh, load types that we're always talking about. Distributed load, okay? The air that is blowing across this wing and is creating lift, it doesn't act in like one sharp pointy place. There's air all over this, below, above, you know, it's, it's pressing up, there's suction, there's low, high pressure regions. Um, it's a very distributed load. Um, it's not as though the lift acts here or here or here. It's that smooth profile. Actually, if you have a really well-designed wing, it's, it's very low out here and it actually gets bigger toward the middle. Um, that's called an elliptical lift profile. Don't worry about that, we'll treat it as a constant. But you would take that distributed load little vector field and then of course you would turn it into one point vector in the very middle of all that okay but I just want to show you how like real life situations they are distributed load situations and then we turn them into point loads because then we can actually analyze it and then of course we do get point loads as well like uh, what if what if there was like a bomb or an engine or something hanging off the wing okay attached with what's called a little pylon p-y-l-o-n a pylon Okay, right there. That would be a really good thing to model as a point load because it's, it's coming at like one particular place. It's probably attached to one of the ribs and that is makes perfect sense. 
to do a point load pulling down, which would create both a vertical reaction here and also a moment reaction to resist the downwards moment. Okay, so there you go. A very common example. There's planes flying overhead all the time. Thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of planes in the world um, living examples of what we're talking about. Okay, I think we will jump into the video. I'm going to go straight into a example that shows those things I've just talked about. I won't say it all over again. So if you're ready with your pen and paper, here we go. So fixed supports, distributed loads, and concentrated moments. There is um, no like neat and clever way to say all that, by the way. That's the best I could do. This uh, picture I've drawn here, this is how we would show the first of those three things. This is a fixed support or a fixed end condition. You know, this is the, the welded, the, um, the bolted, this is the, the pole cemented in the ground, this is the, the flagpole sticking out from the wall, or in the example I just showed you, it's the aeroplane wing attached to the body, okay, in a very, very simple diagram format. So let's, let's run with the aeroplane idea. And um, I think I've said this, the Wright brothers actually did call it an aeroplane when they first invented it. So I am going to stay with that. Let's say that we could approximate a good old, you know, handy dandy lift force of 500 newtons. And forget what I said about distributed forces for now. Let's just uh, act as though it is a perfect pointy point load. And um, I'm doing this because I don't want to give you too many things at once. So here's the thing. Let's say it is uh, it is 10 meters long. Fifth, five, so sorry, 500 newtons right there in the middle. Those are the applied forces. Uh, there's no friction. Let's ignore self weight. I'm just kind of checking off the list here. But what do we do for fixed supports when we get to the reactions? What are the reactions for fixed support? Because remember, for simple supports, there is um, there is one possible reaction. Okay, remember we draw simple supports something like this, and we say that there is one possible reaction. It must be straight back up, just like that. We have done um, pins or hinges, and we show those, you know, maybe like that is one common way. And in that case, we have a vertical reaction. It could be up or down. And then we have a horizontal reaction. Could be left or right. Just got to pick one and go with it. But what about this fixed one? Well, the answer is that this one is going to have three reactions. Two of them are forces. One of them is a moment. I did kind of talk about this already in the previous week video before this. But we'll have a vertical reaction. I'll call it RY. There are no other reaction forces, so I don't need to do like R1, R2, R3Y or anything like that. And I'll do R. X, okay, because this thing cannot slide the wing. We said this just then. The wing can't slide up or down. It can't slide in and out of the wall. It's locked down. But it also, it is not a pin joint. Um, if you have a wing that is pinned to your fuselage, you're in a lot of trouble because as soon as that lift force acts upwards, that wing is going to like clap up into the air. Um, and, you know, that does happen actually sometimes on planes, but it's always when the wings are breaking off and that's bad you fall out of the sky and you generally die so we need to show the fact that this thing can resist moments so how are we going to show this i don't know there's there's different nomenclature that you, you could use i will probably uh, let's see maybe i'll call it reaction with an m for moment okay this is a reaction moment um, you could also use capital M instead. You could call it like, you know, moments. I don't know. You, you, well, look, there's nothing else. You could just call it M. The point is that you give it a variable that makes sense. Pick a naming convention throughout your diagram and don't change it. 
Okay, so I think I'll, I'll probably just call it RM. The only danger there is that you could be fooled into thinking this is a force like the other R's. It is not. It is a moment. Whereas forces are measured in newtons, moments are measured in, what are they measured in? Newton meters. If you are in US customary system, forces are measured in pounds and moments are generally measured in foot pounds or inch pounds, whatever your length unit is. Okay, so this is the whole diagram in, in the blue and black down there. That is the whole diagram. That is uh, every force and moment that exists. And so now we start our analysis. And actually, let me as well. I feel like I should just, uh, for the sake of completeness, finish this little trifecta so you can easily see the comparison. You can see this, this could be horizontal or it could be vertical. Okay. All right, so let's do our sigmas. We have, oh, what did I forget? I forgot to put my sign convention in. There we go. Can't be too careful. All right, let's do our horizontal forces first. All forces equal to zero horizontally because this is a statics situation. What force do we have? Make sure you do show them all. And there is one, Rx which we can immediately see is going to be equal to zero. I'm just gonna write that in right now. Okay, please, again, I, I just said this in the live part of the video, make sure you do a little summary somewhere of what your results are. If you write it straight on the diagram, that is great. If you do, like some people do, a little list off to the side, they build up as they go, you could do both, but please, Please do something. Don't let me have to dig for it out of your equations, please. All right, Fy, vertical forces, equals zero, because it's a static situation, and we list them off. We have Ry, we have 500. Both are positive, because both are up. And we can fiddle around with this a little bit. We can say, all right, well, look, what if we subtract 500 from both sides? We will get Ry equals negative 500. The negative, again, the negative does not signify a downwards vector. It signifies that the vector is opposite to what I had guessed. And as I said again in the first part of the video, my preference is that you would actually just label with the 500 newtons and then you know how do i do this um well i guess i just have to redraw and that's not the worst thing in the world is it mm -hmm. Now, again, some of you might feel, wait a minute, but then if we look back at our original, like, you know, vertical force sum equation on this line, now, you know, it looks wrong compared to that. And yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you just got to pick one method. I guess if you were going to really do this proper, you'd probably like redraw the whole thing and then report all the correct numbers with the correct forces. All right, lastly, we do a moment sum, and I am going to do it. Where shall I do it? Where shall I do it? Well, you know, let's, let's do it here. Let's call this location one. Just try something different. Again, some of you might say, wait, aren't you breaking your rule? You're, you're supposed to pick a place where the most forces and things are going through. Why not pick over on the left? Well, because I, I want to actually show you what's happening. But yes, I agree. Um, please do pick those locations. 
All right, moments summed around location one, we will firstly have a negative 500 times five meters. That's this one. We will then have no contribution from Rx because firstly, it's zero. Secondly, it shoots right through my point. Even though it's very far away, it still shoots right through my point. We will have a positive 500 times 10 from this one right here. Okay, it's the full length of 10 times the 500. It's positive because it matches to the sign convention. And then there is one more. And now, so this is a little bit new, so pay close attention here. I'm going to say plus RM. And that's it. Because a moment is already measured in Newton meters, okay, it already has the force and the distance bound up inside of it. Um, this is one of those like concentrated moments that we haven't used very much, but we've been talking about. We don't have to multiply it by 10 or by any distance. Okay, we have to multiply 500 by 5 and then 500 by 10 because that will give us a force times a distance which will give us Newton meters. That actually creates a moment. But this one is a moment already. So all you have to do, the good news is, all you've got to do is just include it in the list of things. And by the way, when I say list of things, uh, make sure that you are showing the pluses and the minuses. It's an actual sum of things, not just like commas. I know a couple of you have done that from time to time. And so now you have these numbers here. Let's just do the math. I won't skip ahead too fast here. Negative 500 times 5 is going to give you negative 2,500. Plus 500 times 10 is going to give you plus 5,000. Still have just R subscript M. Remember, that's, that's not R times M. That's R subscript M. Uh, then we lump these things together. We, I would subtract 2,500 and then throw it over the other side. At which point it goes negative. And that is what we get. RM is equal to negative 2,500. So I'm going to list this off. I'm going to list the positive value measured in Newton meters because it's a moment. And again, what this means is that not only is this concentrated moment resisting with 2,500 Newton meters, but its direction is incorrect. So I will correct the diagram. There you go. Now it's a clockwise moment and I can list it as positive. So let's step back. What's, what's, what's this telling us? This is saying that for the aircraft wings sticking out with the lift force of 500 newtons straight up, the, the wing root does not need to do any work, zero, okay, zero newtons, for the wing trying to like slide out or slide in, okay? That's not happening. For the wing trying to like translate up or down, kind of like to slide up or down, there's not a lot of resistive force needed. It's, it's only 500 newtons. That's not, not a great deal. But you can see what the wing root is really having to do is create a whole lot of moment resistance, 2,500 newton meters, which is a lot, okay? A lot. So you better make sure that you've got some serious, seriously firm like bolts and brackets and things that will keep this from rotating. This is like the opposite of a pin or a hinge. You do not want this to swing or bend or rotate. You want to make it like one continuous piece with the fuselage. Okay, and that is done by the little bolts and things. In fact, if we really, I'm going to risk doing this, if we really like zoomed in and we thought about how would this thing actually be attached? Well, there'd probably be some kind of like, like a little bracket okay, that it would like slide into or something. And that bracket would probably have like some little bolts that went all the way through. And then those little bolts would actually, um, would actually have like be, be creating a force couple right there. Um, let's see. You'd have one bolt that was trying to pull back down and stay clamped onto the fuselage then you'd have this other bolt would be doing the exact opposite we'd be like kind of 
pushing back out. And you see those two red forces together make a force couple. Um, the magnitude of that force would be would have everything to do with this separation distance because it would be uh, F times D. We talked about these already, force couples, weeks ago. But those are what's actually happening happening at like, like the the local level. Those are the actual forces created in the bracket or the weld or whatever it is that are actually generating this reaction moment. They're the ones responsible for, for creating that reaction moment, which keeps the wing from doing what it is wanting to do, which is to like flip up and clap hands with the other wing on the other side because of this, because of this, um, this 500 Newton force right here. Okay, that was getting a little bit in depth. Uh, if I lost you in that little explanation, do not worry too much about it. Um, but if you understood what I was saying, that's great. Consider that bonus material. Okay, moving right along. I now want to talk about what was the second thing? We had distributed loads. Okay, distributed loads. Okay, let's do let's do another little common one that we have had up to this point. Let's say there is a, okay, a little, uh, little beam, little object that looks like this. We know we can, we can pop them in already. We will have, let's call this R1Y, R1X. This can be R2Y, but now we are going to exert Kind of a little vector field and this is our distributed load and we're gonna refer to this as let's call it maybe like five pounds per inch let's use pounds and inches five pounds per inch and let's just say let's just keep a really simple scale that these squares are one inch five pounds per inch so this could be like a like a like a great big you know hefty sandbag like resting on this beam. This could be uh, a person's shoe is what would that be? 15 inch? No, three three inches long. Okay, it's not someone's shoe. Maybe it's a baby's shoe, a baby's foot. Why is this baby walking on a beam? I don't know. I guess it would also be a very small sandbag too, a three inch wide sandbag. All my examples are falling to pieces, but I think you, you get the idea. This is a distributed load and we're going to analyze it and the way we analyze it is we turn the distributed load into a point load you must convert it you really can't do anything else with it otherwise so if you have five pounds per inch and that is applied over a length. You see this length here is apparently three inches, three squares. Then this is 15 pounds of point load. Okay, five times three gives 15 pounds per inch times inches. You do a little unit analysis, leaves you with pounds. And we apply that, let's do it in green. We apply it right here in the center, the very center of, not, not of the beam, but of the distributed region. Okay, that three inches of distributed region. So it's right there, like one and a half inches into that. Now I should probably also take the time to see where that is. Okay, counting squares, we've got one, two, three and a half. Okay, this is three and a half inches. And I don't know, maybe it'll be relevant. We could also measure the other way. One, two, three, four and a half inches. I clearly have an eight inch long beam. So again, now we have that point load conversion. We basically ignore that distributed load vector field and we just only need to think about the point load. 
and we run through all the same stuff again. And yes, I'm going to do it because the more practice, the better. Even if you're just watching and just kind of trying to predict what I'm going to do next, that is time well spent. Okay, our uh, next, that's the only horizontal force. Let's do the vertical forces. We got R1Y up, R2Y up, and then we have negative 15 pounds down. Notice again, I didn't show the five pounds per inch in this sum because we turned it into a 15 pound point load and now that is all we need going forward. All right, let's take a moment. I don't mean that as a, as a lame pun. Let's take a moment around that point one that is labeled just then. Um, and by the way, that labeling that point one is then consistent with these little ones right here. Um, all right, moments, moments, moments. What have we got? We got the point load 15 times three and a half, and that is negative. We have R2Y times the eight inches. The, oh, oh, wait, boy. Messed that up, didn't I? That's only seven. Look where my simple support is. It's actually one inch in from the end. So we got to be a little more careful next time, Mr. Meath. Seven inches from location one. All right, can you feel the Sudoku puzzle is about to be solved? Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Okay, um, now, you don't actually need to do the system of equations here. Um, I hope you can see that we could simply tackle the moment equation first. First of all, what in the world is 15 times 3.5? If you can do that in your head, that is very impressive. 52.5 plus 7R2Y. We subtract 52.5 from both sides. Now, if you can divide that by 7 in your head, that is really impressive. 7.5. I did not expect that to be so clean. 7.5 is R2Y. Okay, so let's list some of these things off. R1X is no pounds. Uh, 2Y is seven and a half pounds, or eight if we're going to one significant figure. And then now we can actually come back and sort of keep working on this one. We, we set it aside for a while, and you could have done a system of equations, but this, this method is a little easier. I kind of regret pointing you at first towards systems of equations that might have gotten distracting. Sorry about that. A little bit of fiddling with the equations and then um, because we know what R2Y is, we are going to put that in. We're going to substitute it right here. So um, 15 equals R1Y plus 7.5, subtract 7.5 from both sides and incredible turns out r1y is exactly the same and a little bit of logical thought tells us why that is the um this little area this area of the beam right here that i just shaded that is actually irrelevant to the analysis if you clipped that off it would not have affected anything that we did it's just like it's going for a free ride so if you, if you blind yourself to that and get rid of it, what are you left with? You're left with a 15 pound force straight down, which is exactly three and a half inches from both of the two vertical reactions, R1Y and R2Y. Therefore, that is one of those, what was it? Um, uh, super simple symmetric statics situations. It's an SSSSS. And if that ever happens, then you can simply say, well, what is 15 divided by 2? And you get 7.5 and you put it on both sides. That is acceptable and it saves you all of this. All right, that's how you handle distributed loads. We had one more type of thing and that is concentrated moments. Let's do one of those. Um, let's see, let's see. 
I'm going to do two simple supports. I'm going to do one there and do one here. We're going to, oh, you know what, is this going to work? Yes, it will. Let's do this. Okay, let's call each square one foot. I'll work in pounds again. All right, simple support. So let's call this location one. This is R1Y. We'll call this location two. R2Y being simple supports, you only need one force straight up and it must be up, it cannot be down. A simple support can't pull back down, it can only push up. And, ooh, can this be solved? I think so, I think so. I gotta, I have to really be careful here. I gotta be careful not to create a situation which is unsolvable, which is easier than you might think. Okay, let's put a hundred pounds of downwards force. And then we're also going to do this. We're going to grab the end of the beam right here. And we're going to apply a moment of 250, uh, what did I say, feet, 250 feet pounds, foot pounds. And you can show it like that at another way to show those which I have seen is kind of like drawing like a mini force couple, okay, with two forces separated by a little, um, little line. I think I kind of like the one I put on the diagram, but as I say, you'll, you'll see both. You, you might see both. But that is how we show a constrained moment. That is how we show someone grabbing a hold of that beam with two hands and not pushing or pulling up or down, but twisting. Okay. And it's like I'm kind of trying to like twist the beam to be like smooshed down into those two supports. Now, how do we analyze this? Well, good news is we do it exactly the same as always, we say. What is the f of x's? Well, we have nothing, okay? Which is um, maybe a little bit dodgy. You, you should generally have a pin somewhere just to help with any like random sliding that could happen. But, you know, in the world of pure theory, we can pretend that nothing sideways at all is gonna happen. Uh, what have we got? R1y, R2y. Minus 100. The, the 250 foot pound moment does not appear in either of the two force sums because it is not a force. It is invisible to the force sums. They don't even see it. All they see are the forces. Now we'll do the moments and we will do the moments. Let's do the moments around location two. Location two is right here. And here we go, let's list them off. We have, um, let me think here. I had to count squares. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine squares. So we have R, no, negative, <clears throat> negative R1Y times nine feet. We have positive 100 pounds times five feet. We have negative R2Y times three feet. And then we have a positive 250. So that right there, that is how you show this concentrated moment in the equation. It's very similar in principle to how I showed this one right here for that moment, that blue moment over there. That, that moment reaction is really just a concentrated moment, but it's special because it's the reaction. This one is an applied concentrated moment, but it's handled the same way. It just gets listed in the, in the equation. You don't multiply it by any particular distance. And oh my goodness, I just realized I made a mistake. Did anyone spot that as I was summing those moments? No? Maybe you did. I'm going to fix it. When, when I was summing moments, I was actually just then 
I was actually summing moments around this location here, which I'm just going to call location three. I wasn't summing them around two at all. If I'd been summing them around two, I would have measured six when I was here. I would have said two when I was here, and then I would not have counted this one at all because it is punches right through location two. I would have shown the 250 exactly like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that I never did that. I am actually going to erase and I'm just going to say, let's pretend that we were doing around location three the whole time and then everything's correct. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to be confusing. All those distances, distance nine, five, and three are all measured back to location three. And again, the concentrated moment of 250, it doesn't get measured back to anything. It just appears natively in the moment sum, wherever it is. It just gets showed up. All right, here we go. Let's clean up these equations. We will have to do a, a system of equations in this case. There was no way around it. Okay, that was me rearranging the vertical force sum. Now I'm going to I'm going to do a few steps at once here. Uh, we got 500 plus 750. Let's do 750. That's from adding these two things. And then we have 9 times R1Y plus 3 times R2Y. And all the negatives disappeared because when I got the 750 and I subtracted it, it went on the other side, it had a negative sign, but so do the R1Y and the R2Y. They all have negatives, so we get rid of all the negatives at once. That's where they all went. Okay, um, this is actually looking pretty good. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply, let's say, by 3. Let's multiply the whole equation by 3. I'm going to do that down here. We'll have 300 equals 3R1Y plus 3R2Y. We can subtract those two lines from each other. 750 minus 300 is 450. 9R1Y minus 3R1Y is 6R1Y. And then 3R2Y minus 3R2Y is nothing. They disappear. So now I have this handy little result. 450 divided by 6 is actually a very neat 75. So let's write that in. 75 pounds. And then I'm going to search around and say, okay, 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 um, what's my quickest way to find R2Y? Well, I'd probably say this equation right here. Because really, any equation that's on the page anywhere is a valid thing to use. Like every line is true. It is a true statement. So I could actually say, well, I could use like this line right here. I could use this line right here. This one, like... Any of them, you get what I'm saying? So I think the most straightforward one is probably that one right there. We have zero equals 75, that's the R1Y, plus R2Y minus 100, which all in all means that R2Y is 25 pounds. Great, that was it. I had two and I found them both. Um, a quick little brain check, 75 plus the 25 is clearly equal to the 100 pointing down. Um, you can see that the act of twisting the beam at this location three with the 250 foot pounds is meaning that joint one is having to work three times as hard to like press back against it. Um, the way it fell out was our 2 y isn't really having to do whole lot at all. Um, and that is also in part because the 100 pounds is also creating its own moments. They're all kind of interplaying with each other, but that is the situation. So if you were designing this, you would maybe say to yourself, wow, 
I better choose like a bolt or something or a, or a support that is three times stronger than this one because it's getting three times as much load. Okay, that's that's where you where you take this in the long run. All right. Um, we have 10 minutes left. And here's what I want to do at the risk of making your hair fall out. I would like to say what happens when we mix all the ingredients together, we shake them all up and we see what we get. What if we had a fixed beam? And what if said fixed beam was measured in meters? And what if there were a distributed load field of 200 newtons per meter? And what if we had also a force, a concentrated point, magical force, which never really happens in real life, of 100 newtons pointed up? And then what if we, for good measure, had a concentrated moment of 300 newton meters? What if, what if it all just happened all at once? Well, it can, and this is what your assignment is going to be this week. Uh, I'll try to keep it a little shorter, but it is going to handle everything at once. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to show your possible reaction forces. Just be thankful, by the way, I didn't put any angled forces in. So R1x is still going to end up being zero, as we can guess. I will put in the default direction for our reaction moment. So first thing you want to do is if there is a distributed load, man, you better change that thing to be one single point load in the center of that region. Quick, calcul quick calculation tells us that 200 Newton meters times four meters. Okay, that's, that's the length here, four squares, is 800 newtons. So that is actually a legitimate replacement for that distributed load field. Okay, that was step one. Now you do, you, do, you, do, you jump into all of your uh, things, f of x equals r1x, therefore that is the answer. Great, excellent, zero newtons right there. Vertically speaking, we have fy equals zero. What have we got? We got r1y, we got 100, we have negative 800, and that is it. The 300 newton meters does not appear. Oh wow! Look at look at that. Do you see where, what's happening here? This is very convenient. I, before I jump into the moment sum, let me just work out quickly what R1Y is. It's begging to be solved. R1Y is clearly 700 700 newtons. Excellent. That was easier than usual. Okay, 700 plus 100 minus 800 balances out to zero. All right, and then we finish off with possibly the worst sigma that I have ever drawn in my entire life. The moments around location, well, we can just do location one, why not? Okay, what do we have? We have the reaction moment, which is positive. Notice that even though that reaction moment is is centered on location one that we're summing moments around, you do show it. It's only when you have forces punching through the location that you don't show those because the, the moment distance is zero. But when it comes to a concentrated moment, it's already accounted for. Okay, we have 100 newtons times 2 meters. We have 800, negative 800 times one, two, three, four, five meters. And then we have 
finally our little concentrated 300 newton meter moment shows up and there he is or she is 300 newton meters i don't think of moments as being girls i don't think of them as being boys either there it is um all right and this again we have an equation which only has one unknown I am actually going to take my time here, I'm not try to do too many wild things at once. 800 times 5, I'm now doubting myself, but I'm pretty sure that's 4,000, minus 300, RM, uh, 4,100, okay, great. Now this was lovely, it actually turned out that all of the original directions were guessed correctly. That's why, that's how uh, this answer was positive, this answer was positive. Okay, that tells me my guess was correct. I've written it in, it's on the diagram, it's very clear. There is no doubt here that I can step up and analyze this and say, oh wow, you know, this is how much, um, you know, translational force I have to resist. This is how much moment force. I, I better pay real attention to my brackets, or my, my weld. Um, sometimes you find that the moment is actually quite low. Um, like you could, you could actually create a situation pretty easily where you have a concentrated moment that actually helps to balance things out. And it does that intentionally to like, like unstress the weld back at the root. Um, didn't happen here, but anyway, those things are quite possible. So that's it. We'll finish right there. Thanks for watching. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, feel free to rewatch if you need to. And um, we're also going to uh, talk very soon about the next phase in the design projects. So keep an eye out for that. All right. See you guys later.